Everybody's lined up at the box office for the sneak preview of Stab, but they all have those special sneak preview tickets, so why the f*** are they standing in line at the box office? They have an usher standing outside the box office, so why can't she just take the tickets? It's a dumbass white movie about some dumbass white girls. <laughs> That's racist. Yeah, I suppose Sandra Bullock is Miss Ethnicity, right? I'm going to thank Omar Epps for giving us Miss Congeniality three years later. And sh they have another usher taking the tickets that you get when you exchange the sneak preview tickets to the box office. Who the f*** runs this theater? Probably 75% of the movie theater managers I worked with. I like to add that, despite having roughly 500 employees outside to do menial tasks like usher who stands in front of the box office, and person who gives studio swag to customers, and three dickheads in charge of ghost face puppets, and this f***ing guy, they have zero security in this mother only in a Hollywood version of a film sneak preview would there be this kind of chaos. Plus, this is a movie within a movie based on a real-life event where real people were murdered, so this theater crowd is a bigger bag of dicks than a bag of dicks. Also, with the real-life event aspect in mind, did the studio really find it appropriate to give away costumes based on the ghost face killer and the fake knives? If you went to a premiere of a movie about John Wayne Gacy, I don't think they'd be handing out clown makeup and having clowns float above you during the movie. Wait a minute, is her bathtub made of bricks? Is there a potted plant next to the shower? Be Maybe this movie is merely suggesting there's nudity on screen, but the way this was shot in frame, the nudity is a lie. Gotta love those showers with a big huge window next to it for whenever you're hosting peeping toms. While I admire the spirit of this totally out of control sneak preview crowd, there is no f***ing way these people would be wearing their masks while watching the movie. These assholes can't see a goddamn thing! Hello? Hello? How were they able to get the actual ghost face voice? Did the police ever record phone calls in the first movie? Look, I know that Stab is a satirical look at the original screen, but this Casey Becker heard her phone ring when she was about to take a shower and went to answer it. But in the meantime, she also had popcorn popping? This reminds me of that old camp slogan, you can't shower and pop at the same time. There were really too many slogans about showering and popping. Bitch, hang the phone up and star 69 his ass. Damn. So even though everyone in the theater has been making all kinds of noise since the movie started, Maureen's outburst crosses the line. Hey, we're sold out. Oh, cool. You may not have heard the company man there, but he's all excited that they're sold out for the movie, despite the fact that studios give out an overabundance of free tickets for sneak previews. So you didn't sell out, cock face, no matter how much you want to impress the usher girl. By the way, despite a total sellout of seats, and every seat is currently filled, there are still people coming in late for this movie. This is the most exaggerated movie theater scene in history until Inglorious Bastards comes along. Jada Pinkett and Omar Epps stand here talking in front of the auditorium for nearly a full minute and are not crushed by people going to concessions or the bathroom. Considering the wild crowd this movie is showing us, that's impossible. So, Ghostface knew exactly where Phil's ear was going to be on the other side of the bathroom stall. Also, since we find out later Phil was an intended victim, then how did Ghostface know that Phil would be in the adjoining stall at this time? Or that the urinals would be taken? Ghostface could not have entered the bathroom after Phil because he's clearly already in the other stall. I totally get that there are a bunch of people dressed up like Ghostface that have a bunch of toy knives, but how in the hell did no one in the surrounding area see Maureen get stabbed? Even if he thought somehow a knife going into a body was fake, there would still be some sort of reaction. Also, lucky for Ghostface that the studio sent the costumes and a ton of people chose to wear them for the sneak preview. Because if that didn't happen, I'm not sure how the killer's plan works. Forgetting the actual stabbing that's going on right now, I don't think even 20-year-old me would have ever gone to a movie with this much bullshit going on during it. This is the dumbest audience ever to watch a movie not called Jackass. This self-induced isolation you got going is not healthy. I mean, you just lost a lot of your friends to a couple of crazy killers who you then had to murder, one of which was your boyfriend. Is everyone a dick in this movie? You could say what happened in that theater is a direct result of the movie itself. This teacher feels like it's a good idea to start discussing a news story that just broke about some fellow students that got murdered and turned it into some sort of philosophical debate on how film can turn people into murderers or some sort of bullshit. Stab too? Who'd want to do that? Sequels suck. By definition alone, they're inferior films. The definition of a sequel is that it's the next chapter in a series of films. It does not define quality, as that is hard for a definition to do. Aliens is a classic, okay? Get away from her, you bitch. I believe the line is stay away from her, you bitch. It's film class, right? A film class where no one knows that Randy is in fact wrong, and Joshua Jackson's quote was correct. T2. Mm. You bet a hard on for Cameron. And CC has a problem paying attention because Mickey was not the one who mentioned aliens. Meet Derek. He's the kind of guy who hops the railing to make a direct beeline to his girlfriend rather than using the much easier stairs like a normal person. I'm local, but I shot the bingo finals. Gail Weathers, who has a best selling book and a hit movie made out of that book, can only get a cameraman who shot the bingo finals. So I get that there would be a press conference, but would they have that press conference on the college campus? The kids weren't murdered on the campus. This seems like a very convoluted way to get Sydney and Gail to meet up early in the movie. I heard about what happened and I was on the next plane. Even if the story broke earlier the previous evening, how quickly could Dewey get on a flight and get there by the next morning? Well, I was hoping I might get just a few words with you. After the events of the first movie, Gail actually thinks she can get away with sandbagging Sydney and not get punched or slapped. Do you wanna die tonight, Cece? 
CC casually answers the call waiting after having her life threatened. Call campus security. So CC's on campus. If the sorority houses are on campus, then why would you need a sober sister? Hi, I'm calling from the Omega Beta. Sorry, One of the many moments in this movie where the killer catches a lucky break in their plan. Hey. <gasps> Who enters a room like this? Good thing CC left that door open and the killer now knows that CC has a troublesome boyfriend. Both this and the theater murder have relied on a lot of coincidences that Goatface could not have known about for everything to go according to plan. Also, movie gives away the fact that there has to be at least two killers, since the one in the background of this scene clearly doesn't have a phone. Hello, Ted. You wish it was Ted. Uh-oh. It sounds like the guy on the other end of the line has cruel intentions for Daphne the Vampire Slayer, and a simply irresistible grudge because he knows what she did last summer, and something something Harvard man. Somehow Ghostface goes from five feet behind CC to an entire hallway's length between shots. What asshole parks their bike three stories high in a goddamn sorority house? I get that CC was just trying to run away from the killer, but how was her strategy going to pan out? Was she going to jump from the balcony? And not once when she has the chance does she close the door behind her and try to lock it. This was pretty much Sarah Michelle Gellar's movie career in 1997, getting stabbed by the killer. I think it even happened in Beverly Hills' Family Robinson. Why does Sydney feel the need to answer this phone at a sorority she's not even a part of and never will be? The killer somehow managed to lock the door from the inside in a way that it could not be unlocked again. That's some crazy shit. So is Ghostface trying to kill Sid here? Because based on what we find out later on in this movie, that makes zero sense. This asshole runs inside the sorority house and leaves his girlfriend outside alone. And while I admire his need to beat the f*** out of the killer, I can't believe a protective boyfriend would just leave his girlfriend outside when he doesn't even know what the situation is. Why would anyone go back in that house anyway? Exactly! Because he's totally the killer, right? Derek's actions in this movie are more like make me a suspect than anything that makes sense. As well as her boyfriend, Stephen Orth. I send Phil Stevens. Maureen Evans, Maureen Prescott. That's Sydney's mother. I don't think this ever gets developed, and it turns out to be bullshit anyway. But what are the odds of this? The killer finds a couple who have the same or similar names to the first two victims of the Woodsboro murders, then kills a third person who just happened to have the same name as the third victim? It's a total red herring, but it's some incredible bullshit if it wasn't on purpose. Do you think someone's trying to duplicate Woodsboro? I think after questions like this, Dewey has no reason to question anything Gale writes about him in her book. I think you have a copycat on your hands, Chief. If this wasn't obvious after the first three people were murdered and Sydney was chased around by someone in a ghost face costume trying to kill her. Also, why is Gale even here? Maybe they would let Dewey in since he was a cop on the original case. But Gale is still a reporter and hasn't exactly proven herself to be trustworthy. The director said, let's have your character start this scene carrying an apple in his mouth. It'll make him look even more like the obvious killer of this movie and an asshole. Also, notice how Derek is eating a green apple while Mickey eats a red one. Yep, they're both equally assholes. Just one's a killer is all. What is he doing? Uh, Tom Cruise Top Gun 1986. You know what makes the film nerds in these movies so f***ing annoying? Naming the actor, the movie, and the f***ing year during a movie reference. I think I love you! Movie has time for this. Also, this is cute and all, but wouldn't Sid's bodyguards be at least a little on alert here? So this seems like the definition of a distraction. Kudos to Scream 2 for making Sydney's joke prediction from the first movie come true, that Tori Spelling would play her in the movie about her. But even in the 90s, can you name one movie where Tori Spelling would have been given the lead in any major film? Who discovers that her boyfriend's this crazy serial killer. God damn, Tori spoiling alert. How would they know this scene even happened? There is even very similar dialogue. Gail Weathers was not present for this, and based on their relationship or lack of one, I'm not guessing Sydney let Gail in on any of these moments. When my mom left my dad, I accepted it. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Holy sh! This Luke Wilson take on the Billy Loomis character is fing priceless. The guy's pre madness pity me service wound conveniently missed every major vein and artery. So you think it's Derek? Now Dewey is taking opinions from a college kid film nerd seriously? He might be the worst cop ever. First of all, he wasn't gutted. I made that up. His throat was slashed. Why would you change that detail? I need you. I cannot do this without you. Not trying to belittle a camera person's job, but would it really be that hard for Gail to find another person to fill in for Joel? Cassandra is one of the great tragic visionaries of literature. Maybe it's just me, but I don't remember this time-wasting bullshit in the first movie. You saw it all coming. The wars. The murder. Jesus, this movie is on some serious foreshadowing overload in this scene. With all that's going on, it's totally asinine that the drama teacher would put her in a scene where she's basically repeatedly being stabbed by masked strangers. <laughs> hey guys, you think maybe all the knives and stabbing motions of this production could be affecting Sydney in some way? Nah, she's just crazy. F her. You know, I'm gonna go ahead and give the movie at least one sin for not making these two the killers. The killer's trying to finish what was started. This is a very good point that Randy is making, and by the end of the film, this is clearly the motive, which begs the question. 
Why the hell were the first three people killed? And how did the killers even know if anyone would figure out the first three victims were tied to the previous victims, especially since it was such a loose threat? Okay, so what do you want to do, Bonehead? You just want to sit here and wait and see who drops next? Well, I don't know. Bonehead. <sighs> what do you want me to say? I, I don't know. Just keep him talking. Come on, Gail. Yeah, let's split up because that's never been a bad idea in a horror movie, and Randy should know better. Also, why don't Randy, Gale, and Dewey have police protection as well? They also survived the Woodsboro murders. Am I close? Closer than you think. Randy is conveniently jump-scared by random people that have nothing to do with his current predicament. What was the killer's plan if Randy had chosen to walk with the phone in the opposite direction? Like I said earlier, these characters literally walk into their murders. This is pretty close to the employee who wears headphones at work and doesn't hear the violence trope, only possibly more infuriating. You have an instant message, that's how I'll just hit out him. <laughs> Hilarious 90s computer lingo. <laughs> Damn dude, he said hit all M, not QWERTY or whatever you just typed. Wait right here. Sure. Yeah. Worst bodyguard ever. Oops. <laughs> said you okay. How the f did Cotton know Sydney was standing right here? He's not the killer, and he's not f Yoda, so what the f also, why did he decide that the f***ing library was the time to approach Sydney about being on TV with him? And why is he being so creepy? Remember when Gail sandbagged Sydney earlier? Even he looked shocked that Gail would stoop so low. So now he's an asshole stalker? Just to add him to the list of suspects? We've issued a campus lock-in this evening. No one's allowed out after dark, okay? If Sydney's being taken somewhere else, what the f*** does she care if people aren't allowed out of their dorms after dark? Uh, they impounded my van. It's now an official crime scene, thanks to you. Um, because the killer opened your unlocked van and used it to kill Randy, it's Gail's fault? If the killer really is watching and relishing every minute, then he'd be here on these tapes, right? So, let's go use the school's facilities to watch these tapes after hours, instead of going to your television affiliate and watching them. By the way, it was totally daytime when they decided to watch these tapes, and now it's totally nighttime because I guess this campus is vast. There is no f***ing way that Joel shot his footage using regular-ass VHS tapes. He probably used Betamax or some sort of totally not VHS tape, because VHS is not what you would use for broadcast quality, even if your main claim to fame is the f***ing bingo finals. Sorry. Oh. Oh. Is it possible to meet cute a second time? Scream 2 delves into the hot topic I have no interest in. Gail and Dewey are watching a recording of the previous day's press conference, but in the earlier scene in the movie where we see this press conference, there is an entirely different guy standing next to Hartley. We're looking for the killer who might be on this very tape. Let's f I should be studying. You know I got a bio. This shot of Omar Epps and Jada Pinkett suggests that the killer shot this footage from a parked car on the side of the street. But I remember that scene vividly, because in the establishing shot, I noted that there were no cars parked on the side of the street. I know what you're thinking. Maybe they're on the other other side of the street, but then the person operating the camera couldn't get audio this crisp. So let me get this straight. Somebody, probably Mickey, decided to edit all his stalker footage together just in case Gail and Dewey came here tonight to watch their footage. Why is the first instinct here to find the first room you can hide in? Why is getting the f out of there not the first thought? And it looks like there's an exit at the end of this hallway, but it's being obscured by the fact that this is a horror movie and lack of reason and logic. This is a very cool set piece, but why is there a maze of soundproof walling? And even if that is a common occurrence in sound studios, how does Gail end up in the one room that has a series of items she can hide behind while the killer is stalking her? I mean, she could have just as easily trapped herself in a janitor's closet. <laughs> so the killer didn't hear that <laughs> There's no lock on the door, so why is she not dead? She's, she's fine. I'm her therapist. Hallie and Sid share the same room and would have been getting packed together. Furthermore, Hallie said at the police station she was coming with Sid, so I'm not sure why the cops are on edge when Hallie comes out and she has to explain herself. And the cops didn't even flinch when they saw Derek creepily waiting outside for them. When this is all over, I'll still be here. <laughs> I'm not a guy. I get this has nothing to do with Ghostface and is some frat bull but everyone has to know a killer is walking around dressed up and hacking up people. The chief even instituted a curfew for the campus. So why the f*** would anyone dress up as anything and hide in the shadows? Don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> Apparently this security detail was going so slow, the killer was able to follow them and keep up with them on foot until they stopped at a traffic light. Either Mickey or Debbie Salt just killed a trained detective, was able to basically climb in one motion on top of the car, and is able to pull off a nifty kick to another trained detective. I don't think Mickey or Debbie fit the Jackie Chan mold, but here we are. Also, if I haven't said how much these cops suck before, I will now, because these cops f***ing suck. Out of the car, you f***er! Just shoot his ass! How are you supposed to get out of here? We're not in his cop car. Yes, it's a cop car, but the killer was able to punch his way through a window a minute ago. Why can't you guys kick the window out? Movies keep trying to sell us on the idea that a killer can regain consciousness and exit a car without anyone hearing or seeing anything, even though they were only 20 feet away. He's gone. What? 
Remember the situation they were in? They couldn't even open the door on the passenger side. They were in such tight quarters. As he runs after Sydney, look at the obstacles he had to navigate here. A wall that completely blocks him from running anywhere but the goddamn street, where Sydney and Harley would have seen him. I found Dewey. Why are you on campus right now? Cotton is not the killer, folks. No matter how much the movie tries to put him in situations that make no sense for his character to be, unless he was the killer. I almost got killed. Where should I run? Got it. I'll go to the theater. It's brimming with cops. I mean, props. Hello? Is there someone who's at least a second year drama student who can help me? So did the frat asshats just leave Derek here, knock him unconscious and duct tape his mouth? Yet another convenient chain of events for Ghostface. Does the killer actually have to do any of his or her own work in this movie? Surprise, Sydney. So wait a minute. Was the plan to unmask and explain all the motives to Sydney? How many times could she have died in this movie? What the f*** does the knife do from this distance? You have a gun, remember? This is Loomis? Sydney recognizes her immediately, but yet somehow never saw her the many times she was roaming around campus. Deb there, my backer. We met on the internet, psycho website, classifieds. The actual story of how these two teamed up together is way more interesting than the punchline this movie explains it away with. I think it's either dumb luck or f***ing impossible. Mickey was a good boy, but my god, that whole blame the movies motive. Once again, why are we talking so much and not trying to kill Sydney like you did 30 minutes into the movie? My motive isn't as 90s as Mickey's. Mine is just good old-fashioned revenge. F*** you! Did you really have to go through with all of this to get Sydney back? And now I kill you, and I can't think of anything more rational. You're never gonna get away with this. You're right! So instead of killing you right now, let me explain to you how I'm going to get away with this. And by the way, is campus security on holiday or something? Wasn't there a curfew? Everything's traceable back to Mickey. Including the cop gun he used to kill everybody. Except for all the people that weren't killed with a gun. You're as crazy as your son was. What did you just say? By the way, not that this couldn't happen, but it seems strange to me that Mrs. Loomis gives this much of a f about her son. Her husband cheated on her, and yet she's the one who needed to leave? She couldn't get custody of her son? What kind of f***ed up reasoning is this? There's no way she cares this much about her son if she abandoned him in the first place. Sure, let's just chalk it up to her being crazy, but I'm not buying it. Wait, are these, like, real rocks? Not stage rocks? I guess they teach method at this school. You mean Sydney ran into this room and didn't immediately exit this place? She knows there's an exit back here, goddammit. This isn't a surprise for f***'s sake. Don't you f***ing move! Cotton X Machina. Also, why the f*** is Cotton here? Why would it have occurred to him to go to the theater? The last time we saw him, he was at the film school, making Gail think he was the killer. So naturally, he wandered around campus for 15 minutes and ended up here. If Sydney didn't get shot, then why the f*** is she pretending that she did? Do you feel the effects by osmosis or something? For the press statement. This is Gail, who was alive. Who the f*** does this? You didn't want to say help or something? I always come back. <laughs> How many times did this mother get shot? It was three times by my count. Even if he's alive, how can he shoot up like this when he has virtually no blood left? I'm back. I don't blame Joel for coming back after all the shit's gone down, but why would Gail allow him back? Here's Dewey, alive, after eight hours of unconsciousness with major stab wounds. The paramedics say something like the knife went into some old scar tissue and saved his life, but doesn't blood loss count for something? Talk to Cotton. He's the man you want to interview. He's the hero. And so every reporter leaves Sydney, despite the fact that they try to interview her all the time for whatever the reason. Rise, she said. Don't let the happy 90s sound of collective soul fool you. Everyone Sydney was friends with in the first and second movies are dead now. Who does she have? Dewey? The drama teacher? By next week, he's one of the bad guys in Titanic, so not him either. So I take umbrage with this happy ending. I gotta, I gotta stab her three times. No, you don't gotta f stab her three times. I found that canned ham, and I put it in a pot of boiling water, and guess what I'm calling it? Soup? Hot ham water. I mean, look at you, you already got hurt. Just a flesh wound. Just keep him on the phone. What do you want me to say? Now here's the plan. You go over there and f them, we'll stay here and masturbate. <laughs> It's Diane Sawyer. Hello! Think but fly <laughs> thing! Ding, 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 ding! Yes, might have gotten away with it too. If it wasn't for these blasted kids and their dogs. Now who's doing that? Say it!